pues eh, nuevamente muchas gracias por estar aquí el día de hoy. Quiero, antes de iniciar, quiero dar un aviso. Hay algunos cambios en la agenda porque desafortunadamente no nos es posible tener la presentación de clima espacial que se tenía planeada. Por lo tanto, va a haber un pequeño ajuste en donde primero tenemos la presentación de mapeo de rayos que a cargo del doctor Scott Lindstrom. Luego tenemos eh, eh, la parte de instrumentos ABI, productos nuevos y bandas, también por el doctor eh, Lindstrom. Luego vamos a tener un pequeño receso de 11.30 a 12, para posteriormente tener tres presentaciones, una relativa a satélites polares, otra que nos va a dar eh, la maestra Gabriela Gómez, relativa a... Eh, acceso a datos y finalmente nos va a acompañar Jorge Humberto Bravo con una pequeña presentación relativa al uso de datos de Go16 para la protección civil. Eh, tendremos la comida y eh, estamos pensando terminar el día de hoy un poco más temprano, igual que ayer a las 4, si no tienen inconveniente, creo que a todos nos conviene eh, apurar un poquito el, el taller y salir más temprano. Entonces, bueno, sin más preámbulo, Mr. Lindstrom, Dr. Lindstrom, please. Could I get a handheld microphone so I can pace while I'm walking? Well, I'm talking, I mean. Um, it's great to be back in Mexico City. I was down here two years ago when we did a little presentation for the Servicio Meteorológico Nacional, SMN, um, talking about GO16. But uh, I like to walk when I'm talking, so I'm going to be not tethered to the podium. I'm going to start today. Thank you. I'm going to start today talking about the GLM, the Geostationary Lightning Mapper. Um, a little anecdote, we went out to La Cardinal for dinner last night, down by the government buildings, and as we came out, there was thunder, and whenever I hear thunder now, the first thing I think is, I wonder if the GLM saw the lightning. So I went back to the hotel room, and sure enough, there were flashes in the GLM at the same time that we saw them down on the ground um, downtown. So I, I always like to do that. Um, so without further ado, there's some contributors to this. Um, Steve Goodman is the former GOES, our chief scientist. He's now retired, but he was, he's really a lightning guru, I would say. Uh, Je Jeffrey Stano is a GLM satellite liaison at NASA Sport and Scott Rudlowski at uh, Noah Nesdis works a lot with the GLM now. So they're all working very hard to get this in front of forecasters at the National Weather Service. And also two people I work with at SIMS, Dave Sandek and Russ Dangle, have worked with getting it into real Earth, which I'll talk about too. And then I have some imagery from Bill Line, who is a forecaster uh, in the US National Weather Service in Pueblo, Colorado. So what are we going to talk about today? What's the agenda? Um, how does the GLM work? Some examples. And where can you find it online if you're not in the office um, and you're just kind of interested to say if you see lightning to see if the GLM also sees it? So the objectives when we were done here, I hope you'll be able to describe GLM observations. There are three different kinds. Um, understand how you can use it operationally. I'll give some input on that, and also, as I say, know where you can find it if you're away from the office. So the GLM is a new, new instrument from a geostationary perspective. There have been lightning observers on polar orbiting satellites, but the GLM is the first, uh, this is the first time the GLA lightning sensor, an optical lightning sensor, has been placed in geostationary orbit. 
So it stares just constantly at the Earth. So we, we see it up here. And I'm thinking of an old, because uh, it was designed in, a, in the late 90s. Everything on GO-16 was designed in around 1999, something like that. Um, but we have an old CCD um, uh, camera staring constantly at the Earth. And if you, see, if you see lightning at night, it lights up the cloud, and the GLM can see that. And during the day. So here's, uh, here are two other pictures. So if you're looking straight down, you see an image that looks like this. Um, a lot of the lightning that occurs is not at Nader. Nader, of course, is at the satellite, at the satellite sub point at 75 degree, 75.2 degrees west on the equator. So here in Mexico, or as you get farther north into the United States, you're not looking straight down at the, saddle, at the thunderstorm, you're looking at the side. So, you know, here you're seeing the side of the cloud illuminated, and you're just seeing a little bit of the lightning leaking out of the top, versus when you're looking straight down, you just see this puddle of light at the top. And when you have an image like this, you know, and the satellite's somewhere over there looking at it, it sees the light here, but then it navigates it, you know, follow that line all the way down to the Earth, and it's navigating it to that point. So I'll talk a little bit about the parallax issue with GLM. It's also there with ABI, in that the, where the satellite is navigating the points to assumes clear skies. And when we have something like this, this thunderstorm has grown in a region that's interrupting the, vi the view from the satellite to the Earth, but this is all going to be navigated back to that point on the Earth that the satellite would be seeing if that cloud wasn't there. So there's a, there's a parallax issue. The nice thing about it is it's pretty constant. It's, it's variable with cloud height, but if you're in one location, it doesn't change for a cloud height. So you get used to it. So you'll see a displacement, and you'll think, oh yeah, there's a parallax issue here, especially when you compare it to, par to radar or the other satellite imagery. So as I say, this is a staring digital camera, constantly looking at the Earth. So it can see small variations, very, very small variations in the illumination at the top of the cloud, even during the daytime, which kind of boggles my mind that, you know, I look at satellite imagery from ABI and it's a very, very bright image at midday. And I think, well, how could the GLM see any difference here? Uh, but it does. Um, it was designed to give, give better than 70% detection over the full disk over 24 hours, and it's exceeding that. Um, and it, it does much better at night, as you might expect. It observes all types of lightning in cloud and cloud to ground. Both of those are illuminating the cloud, and you'll have light at the top. And that's what the GLM is detecting. One thing it won't see is cloud to air. I mean, it might, it'll see the bolt in the cloud, but if it's just going into the air, nothing's being illuminated. It's not really going to see that. It also sees meteors. Um, so when meteorites hit the Earth, GLM detects those because there's a change in the light. That's what GLM is looking for. There's a link there for the Gozar website. So when you look at these afterwards, um, you can just click on that link and there's, you go to gozar.gov and there's a whole bunch of information there on the GLM. Oh, and it covers all of Central and South America, uh, down to 54 South and up to 54 North. Here's a picture of that. Um, Go 16 does it all for you. You've heard some information about Go 17. Um, Go 17 will view Mexico and parts of Central America. Um, but GO-16 is also viewing that. So the GLM on GO-17 is operating great. The difficulties, as you heard yesterday, were the ABI and the heating and the cooling. Uh, but the GLM is doing a great job. So you'll be able to get data from GLM from GO-17. Um, but if you're getting it from GO-16, as you see there, it sees all of the Americas, Central and South America. So that's really all you need. As I say, this is a unique, a new instrument in geostationary orbit. There have been polar orbiters and um, low Earth orbit 
lightning detectors in the past. Um, it observes events. Events are, um, I don't like to say grouped into groups, but that's essentially what's happening. So events are merged into groups and groups are merged into flashes. Uh, so the resolution is coarser than ABI, eight kilometers at the sub-satellite point. Again, that's 0, 0.075.2. Um, and then it degrades to 14 kilometers at 54 north and 54 south. It's not a linear degradation. It kind of falls off as a parabola. So you get pretty far north and south uh, with still pretty good resolution, I'd say 8 to 10 kilometers. So um, certainly in Mexico, you're going to be enjoying very good resolution with the, uh, with the GLM. So the events are the actual GLM observations. So if you can picture just a grid that the GLM is looking at, if there's a light anomaly on that grid, that's called an event. When you have um, simultaneous events in adjacent pixels, that's a group. And when you have groups that are separated less by very small amounts of time, 330 milliseconds or 16 and a half kilometers, that's a flash. Um, so you can, all of this data is part of the GRB signal, but looking at the events and the groups is, um, I think that's problematic from a forecaster point of view, and you really want to look at the flashes. And I'll show you some examples of the data that are flowing, at least to the National Weather Service in the US offices. <coughs> so as I say, it's, it's new data, and that's uh, one of the, I guess, difficulties with it is, since it hasn't been up there, it's hard to interpret it. And you know, what, 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 kind of the what kind of the data format do you want to use to be able to best incorporate it into your forecast data flow? So there are some, I've listed some different things that are being shipped to the forecast offices now, optical energy, flash extent density. This one has been around for a while, an average flash area. There's something called the hazardous weather test bed that the United States puts on where uh, new products are tested in an operational environment at the Storm Prediction Center. This runs four to six weeks in the spring, so the GLM has been tested there. You get forecaster feedback to kind of improve what, what goes out into the forecast office. And you can, they blog about it. So if you go to this particular website, um, you can read all about the GLM and how forecasters have been using it. And it's also com coming out every minute. So it comes out with more frequency than CONUS, which is every five minutes, or the full disk, which is every 15 minutes in mode three. So here's a display. Um, right hand, so in the upper right here, this is radar. So half um, half degree reflectivity radar. Um, flash extent density here, um, group area here, and total flash energy. Total flash energy is really closest to what the ABI is actually viewing. <coughs> um, I think it's interesting that it's a quantitative energy estimates. So this is calibrated enough. GLM is well calibrated, so they know exactly how much energy is being put out by the flashes, which is kind of, I thought, that, I mean, that, that seems kind of interesting to me because all you're really seeing is light, but it's calibrated well enough that you know how much energy is being expended in that lightning bolt. And we'll come back to these in a bit. I just, I will note though, you see, here's, here's where the radar is showing a lot of stuff, um, and there is a parallax shift. The flash extent density is shifted off to the north. Um, you can see that with this line extending up into, not sure which state that is, but you can see the uh, parallax shift as well. Here's just another example where a really nice thing about the GLM is if you're in a forecast environment and you have a lot of convection around, so here we have, I think this is a meso sector, and then here we have the conus sector one minute later. There's a lot of information there to look at, but the GLM is 
is highlighting you know, which storms maybe should you be paying attention to. So from a forecaster's point of view, it's kind of distilling the storm that you want to pay attention to. Oh, I didn't know it animated. Sorry. So here's the animation. So, uh, <laughs> so because you have the GLM data, you see which of these many, many different storms are the ones you need to pay attention to. Okay. Siguiente, does that mean next? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, some more strength. So this is just a global view. And again, the GLM is, a nice thing about it is there's, there are land-based lightning detecting networks. Um, but a lot of the uh, southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere is ocean. GLM is telling you where the flashes are over the ocean. Um, GLM is observing total lightning. The others are sometimes only observing cloud to ground. Um, the in cloud is not going to be sampled very well by something that's not GLM. Um, one minute updates, and it's not controlled by a company. Uh, NOAA is giving it, is distributing it freely. So you can display this in real time if you want. And nobody's gonna come knocking on your door saying, you know, give me money. So here again is the domain, comparison to the ground network. So uh, Earth network's total lightning is nearly global. It's best over CONUS. The resolution is pretty good. The frequency is pretty good. Um, but again, it's only really giving you cloud to ground strikes. It's not giving you total lightning. GLM, you see the, uh, you, you see the uh, fields of view there for GOES 16 and GOES 17. It's giving you the flash extent density, total optical energy, every 20 seconds um, remapped to a two kilometer grid. So Earth, the Earth-based networks are giving you maybe better precision in exactly where the lightning bolt is hitting, but the GLM is giving you more information about total lightning. So they're not, giving, they're not comparable observation systems, but they're very um, complementary. So this is a slide I, I took from Jeffrey Stano just to compare the different kinds of um, lightning detection. So we have a chemolonimbus. Uh, these are supposed to be radio towers, I believe. And there are, dump, there are a bunch of different ways to detect lightning other, other than from the GLM. So we have cloud to ground flashes occurring in this cloud and cloud to cloud intercloud flashes uh, occurring with this cloud. Now, if you have very high frequency, something like a lightning mapping array, there are not a lot of those. Um, I know there's one in DC, there's one in Huntsville, Alabama. There are, pl there are places where people are really studying lightning. It gives you a whole lot of information about what's going on. So it, in it observes the intercloud lightning, but it's very short range. It has great accuracy for location, short range. It uses radio waves. So this is used for the lightning mapping arrays. So that's if you have very high frequency observations. If you have lower frequency, something like Earth Network's GLD360 or NLDN, so this is a good range in accuracy with a sensor network. Um, it can distinguish between ground and intercloud, uh, but the cloud to ground gives a better signal. So it's not doing as good a job with the intercloud um, the in-cloud lightning. If you have very low frequency, so this is something that's more global, um, Earth networks and GLD360, you can court triangulate to find things that are 500 miles away. So it's, it's giving you more information globally. Um, it's best at night because the signals are bouncing off the ionosphere, which is stronger at night. Or you can use GLM 
because this gives you the total lightning. Total lightning is important for um, understanding the morphology of a severe thunderstorm, for, for example. I'll give you some examples of that in a bit. It, but the, the difficulty with GLM, well, it's not a difficulty. The, the way it was designed, it only shows you both the intercloud and the cloud-to-ground lightning. It doesn't distinguish between the two. Um, and it's best at night. If you can compare the two, this, is, this was a case done over Brazil. Um, the, spatial, um, the, the spatial comparison there is very good. There are more, um, I think GLD360 has a million, uh, there, are, there are four and a half million GLM groups, and that one in the middle of the Earth networks is a little bit sparser, but um, they're both giving you very nice overlap in the detection. So GLM and surface-based observations are very similar. And if you look at the um, spatial, I mean, they're, they're showing you the same stroke about, uh, at about the same time, too, as well. So they're very well correlated that way. <coughs> now, why do you need GLM? Well, if you're in CONUS, which includes Mexico, you get the five-minute imagery. If you're outside of that, you have to rely on 15-minute, unless they go to mode six, in which case it'll be 10-minute. Um, and a lot can happen in convective development in 10 to 15 minutes. But GLM is observing it all the, all the time. So you can use the GLM data if you're outside of CONUS to say, OK, there was this thunderstorm developing here. Uh, maybe the this, this scan was 12 minutes ago, because you haven't gotten to the, the, you know, the next 15 minute scan. And you can look at how the lightning is evolving during that time to say, OK, this storm is really increasing when the next ABI scan comes. And you can kind of use it as a test to say, you know, predict what the ABI will look like based on the GLM. So that's a nice, that's a nice uh, for people outside of CONUS, um, that's a nice bonus for GLM because it does come every minute. And why I say CONUS, I just mean the CONUS domain for, for GO16. Um, GLM is also doing a better job with total lightning. As I say, um, total lightning is a much more important parameter to look at for severe weather than just cloud-to-ground strokes. Total lightning is important also because typically in-cloud is the first kind of lightning strike you see. So if you are responsible for some kind of um, monitoring a state fair or some kind of outdoor activity, um, and you're looking at the GLM versus an a Earth-based network. Um, so say you're responsible for a soccer game, and there's convection developing, and you're wondering where is the lightning going to happen. The GLM typically shows the in-cloud lightning um, before the cloud-to-ground strokes happen. So if you're responsible for that, that's important lead time uh, for the information to give to the people who might want to say, go inside because there's lightning. So as I say, GLM is good for total lightning. And why do you want to know that? Well, when a thunderstorm is electrifying, um, or when a, when a thunderstorm is, uh, let's say you have some kind of supercellular thunderstorm that's cycling between, uh, that's cycling. So the um, updraft is increasing in strength, uh, drawing up a lot of hydrometeors of mixed phase that allows for stripping of electrical charges. So that it's electrifying as those different kind of electro, uh, hydrometeors get up entrained into the updraft, lightning will increase. Um, so that tells you something about the, the life site, the, what, what point in the life cycle is that storm at? So as the updraft increases, the lightning increases. As the updraft collapses, the lightning collapses. So if you know when, the, when to expect hail or strong winds, when the, light, when the uh, updraft is collapsing, and you see the lightning increasing in GLM, you might say, OK, we're in a region where everything's being suspended in the updraft. So shortly after that is when the hail or the severe or the strong winds might occur. You can also relate it to tornadoes as well. 
So as, as it says, the total lightning is a good proxy for storm strength. So here's, here's an example where you're just combining the imagery. So we have a very strong updraft here because we have very strong total lightning. But notice that the lightning is also extending out um, from the main updraft. So there's a, lot of up, there's a lot of lightning in the updraft, but there's also a lot of lightning very far from the updraft. And I think that's important um, for lightning safety um, to say, tell, tell the people, I'll show, I'll show another example in a minute, to, sh to tell people, you know, the thunderstorm is 20 miles away or 30 kilometers away, but the lightning from that thunderstorm is extending out 15 to 45 kilometers, so you need to be aware now. Okay, here's an, here's an example over Argentina, which is not, under, not in CONUS, and we have a nice mesoscale convective system there with convection running up the front um, in the pampas. So this is at the ABI cycle. So it's, we're looking every 15 minutes, and you know maybe you want to know what, what these storms are doing in between that time. So this is a real Earth, this is a real Earth display. I'll show you how to access the uh, lightning data in real Earth in a bit. You can also look at it at the GLM cadence, where the GLM data is showing up every minute. So you notice the ABI isn't changing much. This is going, so there should be two changes here, one at 7Z and one at 715Z. Um, but we see a lot of the uh, lightning being maintained, so that would tell me as a forecaster that I would expect this convection to be developing, even though I don't see the ABI information there, I do see the GLM with plenty of lightning going on. Um, so there's going to be some kind of uh, propagation of this development of these of the uh, convection up this nice little front. So because GLM is every minute, um, it can tell you something about the ABI in between scans when you're not in CONUS. <coughs> so um, I don't know how many operational forecasters we have in here, but if you were if I were to incorporate this into my workflow. I'm, I'm, if it's during a day where I expect convection, I'm monitoring low-level convection. You can use the split window difference from that. They're baseline stability parameters. The visible, the 0.64 to monitor the low-level low cloud fields. 0.64 and 1.61 to develop, to monitor the convection. Um, look at the cloud phase product and the 1.61 to identify the ice phase. And then, after all that, the GLM comes into effect because once the cloud is uh, glaciated, you're more likely to have lightning. And then again, during a cycling thunderstorm where it's pulsing um, in strength, you can use the GLM to monitor how that thunderstorm is changing strength. Again, GLM shows the lightning can extend well into this stratiform region behind a a QLCS CS or a mesoscale, a mesoscale convective system. Um, this is kind of a National Weather Service centric slide here, but um, do you want to update your SIGMETs, which are significant meteorological alerts? And again, GLM helps you monitor convective updrafts. Just some interesting pictures. This is Harvey in the Gulf last year with GLM overlain on top of it. Um, the red GLM is most close to the ABI scan time, and then as it gets progressively more yellow, it's uh, a little bit older. So this is every five minutes, so we have uh, one minute GLM data in there. So th you're just seeing exactly where the lightning is occurring. Of course, it's not really occurring around the eye. That's um, unusual to see in a hurricane. It usually uh, typifies very s s uh, quick strengthening, so Harvey at this point was not undergoing rapid intensification. But you do see a lot of lightning in the outer rain bands. Okay, this is an actual, let's see if I can get this to, uh, it's an animation and it's not gonna animate for me. Well, if you download this slide, and then you look at it, this is an animation, and it shows a bolt 
spreading out over, all over Kansas. So it's hundreds of kilometers long. So GLM is really helping people better understand exactly how big or how long a lightning bolt can be and how far you can be from maybe the convective region and still be in danger from lightning. I'm sorry it's not animating. It's an embedded MP4. Oh, voila. So let's see if it does that again. Okay, we're... now I probably can't get off this slide. But it's, uh, it's a great image just showing how the lightning expands out. And this is all a GLM observation. Uh, as I said, I can't get off this slide now. Okay. I'm just going to step through how this could be used in the how this is used in the forecast office for severe weather re for severe weather decision support. So we have flash extent density in this frame. Here we have the radar. This is the ABI, the 10.3 micron, the clean window, and this is the uh, um, storm relative motion or the uh, it's the relative motion. Um, so when you see uh, green and red in very close proximity away from the radar, that's typically associated with some kind of strong cyclonic circulation, such as a tornado. So we're just going to step through this. So we have two cores of interest here. So here we have it in GLM. There's one here, one here. Here we have it in the ABI. Um, there's a little bit of an offset because there is some parallax um, with this, so we have it down here. We'll step forward in time. So, and if you look at the radar, lots of, lots of s strong cells, and you're kind of, maybe you're out asking yourself as you're monitoring this, which is the most important one? And that's what the GLM is going to help with. So the GLM is highlighting a lot of lightning in, the, in, these, in this one and in this one that you can't see because it's covered by the banner, so you might expect that that one's not important. So not much has changed um, in the radar in the previous fi 15 minutes. We'll go to the next one, and you'll notice this particular cell is looking a little bit more robust. There's more lightning here, so 21 flashes in one minute. This one is kind of maintaining itself. Looks pretty impressive on the satellite, on the radar. Ditto for this one. Here we have two different GLMs, the two different GLM observations. They look very different. But if you look at the ABI, they look very similar. So again, this is helping you discriminate between the storm that might be producing severe weather and the storm that's you know, just producing lightning. And in the radar here, maybe you've noticed that before, it shows up in the annotation, a hook is forming. So we keep going on here. Notice how this lightning is really increasing. The lightning down here is falling off. Um, so it's really gone up to 36 flashes. We have a hook. And if you look here, we have rotation indicated in the, from the radar. This storm, it's not doing anything now. It might be cycling, it might be collapsing for good. Just have to keep monitoring that one. So let's, I'll just show, let the uh, animation run for a couple of times. And again, you see this, this system here shows good lightning that then kind of falls apart. This one shows lightning increasing, increasing, increasing. Um, with this particular cell, and you see the hook forming. Um, but again, what, what it's really nice for is it discriminates between, you know, if you're, if you're on the radar here examining different storms, and the GLM is highlighting one storm over another, maybe you pay a little bit more attention to this cell than you do to the one to the southeast. As I said, there's a parallax issue with GLM, so I, I thought I'd choose kind of an extreme example. You know, G 
GLM is overhead at 75.2, which is what down here at the equator, maybe down here. Oregon's pretty much at the limb of the GLM observations. So here we have ABI observations um, over Oregon. So this is the border of Oregon and in California. Here's the West Coast. Here we have a thunderstorm. So what does the GLM, what does the GLM see with that thunderstorm? Well, the GLM is showing, the GLM, of course, has been parallax corrected to the ABI. It's showing all these lightning strikes near the convective tower, but there is parallax in the ABI as well. And here we have where the ground-based is showing it. So you, this is something you need to keep in mind when you're using GLM, far from the sub-satellite point, um, is that there is a shift in the GLM observations. So that the, it's observing things shifted away from the sub-satellite point. So, so to parallax correct this, you move everything toward, um, toward the sub-satellite point. So we're over Mexico, a lot closer to the sub-satellite point. Um, so parallax issues won't be quite so extreme. And, as I, and again, as I say, once you get used to them, you just kind of, your brain will automatically make the adjustment. So here's the arrows over CONUS. You know, which way, which way should you adjust things? You notice they're always pointing to toward the sub-satellite point. Okay, and this is, these slides are just a repeat. Some things that happen in GLM that are interesting. Um, so here we have a case where we have the GLM observations in this region, but the ABI isn't really showing much. So we have strong convection down here, but just low clouds here, but even though there are GLM, GLM observations. So um, the assumption here is that the GLM is observing reflection off those low clouds. So remember, it's just looking at a light source. If you have a very bright light source and there are reflective clouds, you can get a signal um, where there isn't actually lightning occurring. Again, these are the products that are available in the Weather Service offices. Another uh, animation from Bill Line. So we have the flash extent density here, the average flash area, total optical energy, and then here we have the 0.64 micron um, red visible with the um, surface-based Earth Network's total lightning um, superimposed on top of that. Um, this data has just started flowing into the Weather Service offices, so they're just really trying to get their feet wet with it and figuring out exactly how to use it. So here we have the same slide, but I've overlain the average flash area on top of the ABI imagery. Um, I haven't looked at these animations enough to become super familiar with it. Um, purple here is, a, is the largest area, though. So you'll notice we do have these very long flashes in the stratiform region um, to the northwest of the very strong updraft. Here's the total optical energy. Again, very close to exactly what the uh, GLM is observing. And the last one is the flash extent density. Um, again, it's, it's showing this nice bullseye over the updraft as the updraft is increasing intensity and decreasing intensity. The GLM is telling you some information about that. So here's another example also from Bill Line, and this was for a county fair in Calhan, um, Colorado. So we have two different um, lines of convection moving through here, and the question was, you know, is there lightning in between those two that you need to be concerned about? Because there's a looks like there's a little window there that maybe, uh, because you're seeing all this uh, surface-based cloud-to-ground cloud lightning 
um, Earth Network's total lightning observations superimposed upon this radar. Uh, but if you look at the uh, GLM, that shows you that there's a lot of, well, it's picking up all the uh, cloud to ground stuff in Calhan, um, but it's also picking up a lot of cloud to cloud in between these two lines. So there is, there are lightning bolts in the, in the, uh, in the cloud, and you really never know when, it, when one of those is going to come down to the come down to the surface. So um, the, the weather service at this time had some responsibility for decision support for some an outdoor concert that was going on. So they were able to use the GLM to help modify their forecast and tell them to, you know, even though this first storm has gone by and another one's coming, there's still a lightning threat. Okay, so this is the an this is annotated. Um, so here we have NLDN shows no lightning, even though, the, but the GLM is still showing the lightning activity there. So it makes it a lot easier, make you more confident in your forecast to say, look, I know the squall line has passed by. There's another one coming, and there's lightning in between those two that you need to be concerned about for this outdoor venue. There are places you can find GLM online. Uh, so this is the one I used last night after seeing the lightning outside and wondering if it showed up, and it did. I was kind of happy about that. And again, you will have access to all these slides, and these are all clickable. Um, <coughs> the Cirrus slider has, uh, well, both Real Earth and the Cirrus slider have ABI data, so you can superimpose the GLM data on top of the ABI, which I find very useful to integrate those two data products. Um, this one is more of a lightning only sport. Uh, NASA Sport in Huntsville has uh, lightning data that you can look at and Weather Nerds does as well. And now that it's flowing to the forecast offices, I think it'll be, um, it'll, I think it'll become a little bit more widely available. So some examples, here's what real Earth looks like. So we have, this is animating every minute. So we're showing lightning. There's a nice convective system coming into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, convection off the Gulf, convection off the coast of Mexico and uh, some kind of tropical wave um, back in early July coming through the Bahamas. Lots of, lots of lightning with that. And you see a little bit of lightning in the Amazon as well. So this is the kind of display you can see um, and this is the full pixel size. So when I zoomed in on Mexico City last night, I saw the I saw the individual Go 16. Uh, yeah, the Go 16 GLM pixels. So Go 16 GLM at the University of Mayor, they're using cesium, which is um, I guess it's a, a substitute kind of for Google Earth. If you don't want to use Google Earth, you can use cesium. Um, but again, that's kind of showing the same kind of distri distribution of lightning. So it has some information about the clouds um, and also the lightning that's superimposed on top. And you can pan and zoom with this. You can, you can see the whole Earth, but of course, GLM is only showing you data um, in this region. If you have any questions, here's some people you can email to. Um, you can email me, Jeffrey Stano, or Scott Rudlowski. Um, they'll, they'll be happy to entertain questions from you, I think. I didn't ask if Jeffrey and Scott will be happy, but maybe they will be. I think they will be. Um, so just a summary. This is a brand new observation system. So it's taking some learning, taking some learning to uh, understand exactly how it works and what use it can use, how it can be used for detecting severe weather. Um, it illuminates, it, it detects illumination at the cloud top. So any kind of lightning that's occurring inside the cloud, that could be cloud to ground, in cloud, um, cloud to cloud if they're clouds next to each other. That has a visible signal um, the GLM is looking at 770 nanometers, so just outside visible range. Um, and that signal is detectable from the top of the cloud. So it's looking at very small variations in 
the um, illumination at the top of the cloud. It's looking constantly in the, uh, the refresh rate is something like uh, on the order of milliseconds. So um, I think that explains kind of how it works because it's looking so frequently, the cloud really isn't changing that much. So the reflection from the sun in the daytime is not changing that much. So you will see changes due to lightning within that cloud. Um, but it's just looking at the top of the cloud. It's not telling you, is this an in-cloud stroke? Is this a cloud-to-ground stroke? Um, you just know that there was a lightning bolt within, um, if you're, it's a sub-satellite point at eight kilometers. If you're farther away, maybe at 54 north at 14 kilometer resolution. It can estimate the power. Um, and as I say, it's being incorporated into uh, warning decisions in the National Weather Service in the US. Um, I like using it for convective snow in winter because uh, it will see the, it will see the lightning associated with convective snow, and you know when this when you have lightning with snowstorms that the snow is really going to pile up. And I kind of like to see that. I don't like snow on the ground. I like to see it fall. So, and I say as I say, GLM data are available online. Um, I'll put my headphones on. If anyone has a question, I will try to answer it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, ¿Hay alguna pregunta aquí eh, de los invitados que quisieran hacer? Por favor. Bueno, gracias por su presentación, primero que nada. Eh, algunas preguntas. El GLM detecta cambios en la en la luz que es reflejada por las nubes o que viene de las nubes más bien en este caso es una parte muy específica del espectro o es toda la banda del visible primera pregunta okay the question um, it's it's looking at just one it's the uh, detection is at 770 nanometers that's the only wavelength that the uh, GLM is looking at. So if there's something happening outside that, GLM will not see it. So for example, um, on July 4th, there are a lot of fireworks. And they were, GLM people were asked, will GLM detect the fireworks? And it doesn't, because that's those, the light emitted from the fireworks is not at 770 nanometers. Uh, gracias. Otra pregunta. Uh, can I say it in English? Sure. Of course. Well, um, this information is, is very good to us. Well, I'm from the Aviation Weather Service. And one of the things I think this can be a very useful tool to detect um, dangerous areas for the aviation operations. And uh, the, is this information uh, available online? I mean, this presentation, are we going to have copies of it? Is it possible? OK. Because I think for decision makers, this is, uh, it could be quite useful to get this information. Thank you. Right, it gives you more information about the convection. And if you're an interest in aviation and telling people where not to fly, that's an important factor. So. Bien, sobre las presentaciones, eh, al final del, del taller, vamos a poner una, una liga en donde van a poder acceder las, este, abiertamente todo el tiempo. Eh, usted. ¿Alguna otra pregunta que tengamos en este momento? Gracias. Para la formación de nubes para granizadas, ¿con cuánto tiempo podríamos contar nosotros para dar aviso o tomar alguna medida preventiva? Um, <laughs> are you looking for an exact time? <laughs> um, lightning typically occurs. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're forecasting for damaging hail, um, typically, I mean, the most, you know, personally, the most electrified storm I've ever seen was 
producing three-inch hail. So it was about four miles from my house, and all I could see was continuous lightning. Um, so the GLM will see that, but if you're, and typically when you have a supercell that's predict, producing hail, um, it's not producing hail constantly, but the, the uh, updraft will be strengthening and weakening and strengthening and weakening. And as, it, as the updraft strengthens, the lightning will increase, and subsequent to that, the hail will fall. Um, I don't know if I can answer you know, how many minutes lead time do you have, because I think that's um, variable depending on the environment that, this, that the thunderstorm is forming in. So it's going to give you lead time. Um, there are, um, this doesn't have anything to do with GLM, but there are products that have been developed by Noah Sims, like Prob, Prob Hale, which combines radar information, satellite information, and lightning information. Right now it's using Earth networks, and it gives you the probability that this storm will be producing hail. So you can combine this information, including lightning, um, to give you, will this storm produce hail? And they advertise it as within the next 60 minutes. So you monitor how prob hail is changing with time, or prob wind, or prob tor for tornadoes, and if it gets to be very high, and you're having to issue a warning, this is just something that gives you more confidence that that warning will verify. So I hope that answers your question. Algún otro? Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días. Eh, considerando tu experiencia en el análisis de este tipo de sistemas, ¿consideras que sería una buena herramienta para el uso, para la eh, identificar los efectos de una línea de tormentas como una turbonada, considerando que son líneas de rápido desarrollo y que se mueven muy rápido. Um, I think for for that kind of system that's developing quickly and moving quickly, I'd probably use. ABI just to monitor exactly where it's moving, but I'd be using the GLM to say, okay, is this going to be producing some kind of, um, is this going to be producing some kind of um, severe weather associated with the up, up the uh, updraft and the collapsing downdraft? But for something that's mo developing very quickly, I think ABI is what you use for that, and then you. Bring in the GLM to get a better understanding of, the, of exactly what's going on with the storm. And the ABI is the next talk. <laughs> Many questions here. Huh? Yeah. That's good. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días. Este, mi pregunta es más sobre el mapeo del, del producto, de los tres productos, me parece que eran. Hay una paleta especial de colores para mapear que estableció la NOA o eh, si es así en qué lugar se puede descargar o cómo se puede ver el formato de esa bueno para los tres productos gracias right there are color maps that have been developed that are used in AWIPS which is the National Weather Service advanced weather interactive processing system that they use in the forecast office so these are color maps that should be available or sh they should be able to get to you um, I'm not sure the mechanism for that, um, but you can certainly send me an email and I'll try to figure out how we can get the color map tables to you. Should put my e oh, there's my email right on the screen. <laughs> Buenos días, muy interesante la plática. Eh, me estoy introduciendo a cuestión de nevadas, menciona que es un elemento importante para ver la intensidad la, de las nevadas, pero ¿qué otro elemento que, que des, del, G, del G16 hay que capturar, hay que analizar para ver la intensidad, severidad de una nevada? I guess, I guess that would also be an ABI question because 
to have lightning in a snowstorm is very unusual. Um, it's, it's very exciting because it means you're getting great snow growth rates. Um, so you have strong upward motion, great snow growth rates, and charge separation, which produces the lightning. Now, for a to, to determine the strength of a snowstorm by itself without lightning, um, I think you would be looking at things like the uh, um, how much deformation you can see in this in the satellite imagery, or how how much cooling you see in the in the in the clean window, telling you that there's strong upward motion. Um, I don't. I, I guess that's all I'll say right now. <laughs> that's a that's a tough question. Alguna otra pregunta por aquí? Maestra Gaby. Perdón. About the parallax problem. Um, so it's it's constant. I mean, in, in different places you can uh, measure how much displacement you have. So you will always get the same displacement in in every single image. I mean, over time. Parallax is a function of how far you are from the sub satellite point, okay. which is constant, but also cloud height, which is not. Okay. So for the same cloud height, um, okay. the parallax shift will be the same at one point. But cloud heights, of course, are always changing. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, typically, you know, in my, in Wisconsin where I live, um, a severe thunderstorm will typically have the same height. Yeah. So the parallax shift is going to be pretty much the same there. So a forecaster in a small weather forecast office in the, weather in the National Weather Service is going to be very familiar with what the parallax shift is. Uh -huh. So when they see this offset between the satellite and the radar, they can say, oh yeah, parallax. Okay, yeah, but uh, my question is more uh, because we're, uh, we want to make maps and to have uh, a perhaps uh, we may need to correct in some point and since we're geography. We are really picky about location, and yeah, if you're doing uh, visual interpretation, it's okay. You can you can in your mind to to take in in account that, and to perhaps in in the screen to move the point where it should be. But if you're do producing maps and you're producing a uh, one-year map or something like that, it's uh, is, has somebody work in that problem? Yeah, it's it's a I don't want to say simple. It's a straightforward geometric problem. Okay. Because it's a linear shift that's based on two things. So it can be done. It has been done. There are lots of papers on parallax shifts. So that's I don't know them offhand. I just know that they're out there. Um, but we can talk later. I can I can give you some names of people who have created imagery for me that shifts the satellite imagery. A difficulty with shifting satellite for ABI imagery is that you'll shift, if you're looking at the visible imagery, it's shifting as a function of the infrared temperature because that gives you the height. And of course, it's a different resolution and then you shift different parts of the visible imagery dif in different amounts and it can make the visible imagery look kind of dirty or not um, sloppy. Okay, so, so you move the image to fit with the GLM data? The GLM is shifted to fit with the ABI data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Alguna otra pregunta por aquí? Hi. I would like to know uh, why GLM cannot distinguish between the different types of lightings and what instrument can we use to detect a cloud to ground linings. Um, GLM cannot distinguish between the two because it's simply looking at what's, what is illuminating the cloud. So a cloud to ground stroke illuminates a cloud and so does an in cloud stroke. So the GLM signal is just seeing light. It doesn't know what's created it. If you want to distinguish between in cloud and cloud to ground, uh, typically the 
something like Earth Networks has um, a cloud to ground stroke has a but is a much bigger perturbation in the radio fields than an in cloud stroke. So it's a much stronger signal. It's much more easily detectable by a surface based um, detection network. So that's that's what you need to use if you if you want to differentiate between in cloud and cloud to ground. Thank you. Alguna otra pregunta? Okay, there's the last one, perhaps. In some cases, uh, volcanic eruptions produce lightning. Will it be detected by GLM? If it has to be, the lightning has to be illuminating some kind of cloud. So if there's a water vapor cloud or a sulfuric dioxide cloud in there that's being illuminated, then it will, yes, it will see the lightning with the volcanic eruptions. Muy bien, ¿alguna otra pregunta por aquí? Okay, so Scott, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, <laughs> tenemos todavía uh, aproximadamente 20 minutos antes de ir al receso del café, entonces vamos a aprovecharlos y vamos a tener una, una charla por parte de Jorge Humberto Bravo sobre el uso de datos Go16 para la protección civil. Entonces, por favor, si eres tan amable. Jorge Humberto trabaja en la Secretaría de Protección Civil del Estado de Veracruz y va a ser muy interesante ver cómo se están utilizando ya estas imágenes para cuestiones prácticas en relación con la protección civil. Entonces, amablemente nos van a dar una breve presentación. Muchas gracias. Bueno, bueno. Eh, bueno, quiero corregir un poco, realmente no lo, no lo estamos utilizando de forma operativa, son algunas prácticas que he podido hacer con datos del GOES 16, con la intención de, posteriormente, de ser posible hacerlo operativo. Bueno, antes… Bueno, bueno. Eh, antes que nada, quiero agradecer… Eh, a los compañeros de la Agencia Espacial Mexicana, que desde que les comenté mi interés en, en hacer una pequeña presentación, me aceptaron, y pues en particular a la Secretaría de Protección Civil que, del Estado de Veracruz, que sin su apoyo no hubiera podido estar aquí. Acerca de mí, pues yo me llamo Jorge Humberto Bravo Méndez, actualmente soy investigador del clima en el Centro de Estudios y Pronósticos Meteorológicos de la Secretaría de Protección Civil, tengo la maestría en Ciencias de Hidrometeorología por la Universidad de Guadalajara. Mis intereses particulares son el, la modelación numérica del tiempo, en particular WRF, lo que es mapas web utilizando eh, tecnología como Leaflet o eh, NASA World Wind JavaScript y en particular también para este caso la percepción remota en meteorología. ¿Cómo obtengo los datos si no tengo una antena de recepción? Bueno, dos formas. Una es acceso remoto, utilizando eh, OpenDAP. En particular, Unidata tiene, tiene unos sitios donde aloja datos GOES 16 o a través de MacAidas B. Yo utilizo MacAidas B, pero también se puede utilizar Unidata IDB para datos eh, a través de AD de server. Y si lo quiero hacer, descarga, pues... Eh, a mi computador, lo que he hecho es utilizar los servicios de Amazon, de Google Cloud Platform y del Open Consortium, Open Common Consortium. además de también el, el mismo, la misma página de Unidata te da acceso al descargar el dato. Eh, software que yo he podido utilizar eh, ma, con mayor o menor tiempo son estos, AWIPS, Unidad IDB, Macaidas B, QGIS en particular cuando ya tengo el dato procesado, eh, pero me he dedicado un poco más en lo que es la cuestión de programación, Python principalmente, con unos paquetes que, que son de PyTroll, en particular el paquete SatPy, 
es el que más tiempo le he dedicado. Previo a GOES 16, a mí me había interesado lo que son combinaciones RGB y me dediqué un poco al procesamiento. Esta es una imagen metop, eh, de este lado es eh, sin, sin referencia, es el barrido tal cual y en el otro lado utilizo QGIS para cuando ya está georreferenciada o cambiada de proyección. Este es un caso que utiliz utilizando este, datos del de sensor MODIS para ver, eh, esta fue la nevada de Chihuahua en febrero de 2015, de este lado en el color mm, real no se podría distinguir entre lo que es nube y lo que es eh, la, la nevada, mientras que si se hace un cambio de bandas, pues es fácil ver la diferencia entre una y otra. También las nubes pueden pues, ahí opacar lo que es la ceniza cuando, cuando hay una erupción, mientras que si se hace una combinación distinta se puede hacer más visible lo que sería una tormenta de arena. Y pues este caso, tormenta el huracán Ingrid y la tormenta tropical Manuel, combinaciones de bandas distintas. Ahora ya con datos GOES 16, lo que me he dedicado a hacer es combinaciones similares, utilizando también Python, en particular la, el paquete SatPy, imagen color verdadero, como, bueno, en, en, en teoría, GOES 16 no podría generar imágenes color verdadero, no, no tiene una, una banda verde, entonces lo que se tiene que hacer es utilizando las tres primeras bandas se genera una banda verde sintética. Estas son combinaciones clásicas adaptadas de UMETSAT, eh, por defecto ya eh, este paquete SATPIPE ya las trae, nada más es cuestión de, de generarlas. Sin embargo, eh, utilizando pues literatura que se encuentra en internet, es de acceso público, se pueden adaptar uno se mete al código porque no las trae por defecto este, este paquete SatPy y uno puede eh, generarlas, se ponen los límites entre temperaturas o albedos y se, es fácil generarlas o relativamente fácil. Estos son eh, otros ejemplos. Estos serían referentes a lo que sería fuego, que me parece que también el doctor Lindstrom hablara de eso. Eh, otras más, el, por ejemplo, esa, esa última de la esquina es para monitoreo de SO2. Estos son ejemplos utilizando Macaidas B. Ayer la maestra hablaba sobre proyecciones, eh, también se pueden hacer cambios de proyección, este es en particular de proyección de Inegi. Y en teoría aquí tendría que haber una animación, pero no apareció. ¿Qué pasó? Bueno, aquí eran un, un par de animaciones que hice con Macaidas B para lo que sería una tormenta de arena y lo que sería el monitoreo de ceniza volcánica en una operación del Popocatépetl. Espero que… ¿Perdón? No, es que el compañero me parece que movió la carpeta y se rompió el vínculo posiblemente. Y pues, gracias. Muchas gracias, Jorge, por tu presentación. Eh, eh, ¿Tenemos alguna pregunta para Jorge? ¿A, eh? ¿A dónde vas? Eh, 
¿Qué tal? Este, en, ¿De qué manera estás incorporando toda esta información que tú estás obteniendo a este, tu sitio de trabajo de, en protección civil? O sea, ¿de qué manera están aplicando en protección civil en Veracruz? Claro, mira, mira, yo ahorita lo que estoy haciendo son test prácticamente. Eh, en primer lugar, porque la capacidad de almacenamiento es muy grande, he tenido la oportunidad de generar algunos scripts con Python para que esté descargando los datos conus cada cinco minutos. ¿no? En menos de un minuto me descarga las 16 bandas, pero no tengo el soporte de espacio para almacenamiento. Entonces, lo único que he hecho es test, test con la intención de, de que en algún momento que tenga la capacidad de almacenar, pueda generarlo de forma operativa. Eh, le comentaba aquí a unos compañeros que también, como me gusta lo que es mapas web, he tratado de hacer un, un portal web, bueno, páginas web con Leaflet, a modo de hacer animaciones, animaciones sin necesidad de tener un software en especial. ¿no? Esa, es, esa sería mi intención. Eh, ese trabajo, aunque fuera local en, en, en mi área de trabajo, pero tenerlo disponible de forma automática y operativo. ¿Y si tienen ya planes con, en, tu, en protección civil de utilizar? Pues supongo que los planes están, el problema es, te digo, el recurso. ¿Y, el, este, ¿y qué es lo que utilizan normalmente este, como insumos meteorológicos para…? este en... Pues lo principal que se utiliza es como los tipos de productos que nos mostraban aquí los doctores en estos días, lo que está en internet, imágenes de acceso libre que ya están, ¿no? que ya no se tiene que estar este, uno quebrando la cabeza. Pero este, ¿qué tan oportuna es la información? ¿Cuál es la, el lapso de entre que…? O sea, ¿qué tan antiguas son esas imágenes que pueden consultar? No, pues son las imágenes que están ahí en tiempo pues, ah. real. Okay. Gracias. Hola, ¿qué tal? Oye, ¿tienes idea de algunos productos de los que estén interesados a partir de esto? O sea, aparte de imágenes, darle un tratamiento a la información como tal y generar productos de algún tipo, pero específicos así que les puedan ayudar a, a este, ahí en el departamento. Pues eh, la verdad no, no sabría comentarte. Como te digo, esto, esto más que nada lo hago uh, de forma personal, porque a mí me gusta hacerlo. Eh, yo he tenido la intención de un producto muy puntual, eh, identificar las zonas convectivas y darle seguimiento, darle seguimiento, darle seguimiento, utilizando programación Python ¿no? para, para ver trayectorias de tormentas convectivas pero eso es algo muy particular que no he tenido la oportunidad de, de darle seguimiento. Bueno, bueno, eh, la pregunta que tengo es, cuando haces la descarga de las 16 bandas, ¿se descargan en la resolución completa? Sí, sí, se descargan en la resolución que corresponde a cada una, Tal vez la que tarda ligeramente más es la banda 2 por ser la de mayor resolución, pero en general, en, eh, hace un rato les comentaba a los compañeros que eh, de las de, de Google y de Amazon me tarda del orden de 26, 27 segundos en descargar las 16 bandas y de Unidata me tarda 45, 47 segundos en descargar las bandas y generar las combinaciones podría ser la color verdadero la más tardada. Okay. Pero en menos de cinco minutos se pueden generar las. He logrado hacer del orden de 27 combinaciones RGB solo por test. Cuando haces esa combinación, ¿no, haces, no aplicas ningún recorte, solamente lo haces hasta el barrido completo? Sí, solo el barrido del Conus. Solo me he dedicado a Conus porque descargar eh, full disk sería muy pesado. Sí. Y... Sí. Ok, gracias. ¿Alguna pregunta? Thanks, very cool.
Uh, SIMS, the University of Wisconsin has also developed something called the Satellite Information Familiar, fam Familiarization Tool, or SIFT, which is also based on Python, but you can input the data there and visualize, it's another way to visualize the data. So it's been developed by the National Weather Service. Um, so it's freely available online and I can show you how to download it. And you just, you get the NetCDF files either from class or from from CSPPGO, and it makes RGBs and band differences as well. So it's just another way to look at the data. But this is really cool. I like looking at it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Eh, muchas gracias. ¿Alguien tiene alguna otra pregunta? Bueno, entonces tenemos ahora el, el coffee break de media hora programado. Si nos vemos aquí 10 minutos antes de las 12, estaría muy bien. Ahora nada más le quiero comentar cómo seguir el programa. Después del Coffee Break tenemos un par de presentaciones más, que es la de eh, satélites polares y la de acceso a datos. ¿Sí las podemos tener, Gaby, de las dos presentaciones? Después del Coffee Break y después ya nos vamos al lunch y cerraríamos después del lunch con la última presentación de, de Scott sobre instrumentos ABI. ¿Correcto? Excelente. Bueno, entonces disfruten su café y nos vemos aquí 10 minutos antes de las 12. Muchas gracias.